they do, I mean, as, as you've seen, because this is what you have is the review of, of yeah. the project since like 1996 when this place opened. So you see that like they have a whole bunch of cool stuff that they've been doing. Welcome to Follow This, a series where I do my best to highlight great resources related to behavioral and mental health. Today I'm in Baltimore, Maryland to meet up with Forrest and August, two researchers of the Johns Hopkins Center for Learning and Health who work on a team trying to address ways to address poverty and behavioral and mental health concerns. Okay, so maybe to start, can you just tell me who you are, what your role is here, and a little bit about the center? Sure, yeah. Um, so I'm August Holton. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Johns Hopkins University, which is where we are right now. Um, I'm an associate director of the Center for Learning and Health, which we're a treatment research unit that's focused on trying to promote employment and reduce substance use among unemployed adults who have substance use disorders. Now I would say I'm a little bit more removed from um, participant interaction on a daily basis. I have more of, um, I guess, an administrator role where I'm kind of overseeing um, the study's progress and monitoring its progress, but I don't do the like one-on-one -on -one, um, delivery of interventions to participants and things like that. Um, we have staff members that are absolutely fantastic that do a lot of the like daily jobs of um, like collecting your analysis samples from participants in our lab or overseeing their work in the therapeutic workplace area. Yeah. Um, a lot of that the participants will do computer-based training when they're here with us so they can just kind of those programs are self-paced and tailored to the individual participants so they can kind of do their thing while they're here working. Yeah. But, all right, first, how do you even approach this topic? We typically talk about it as a psychosocial treatment model because it's more behavioral based. So we're, you know, we're, we're arranging contingencies to try to promote employment and drug abstinence. Um, we have done some studies where we've incorporated more of a medication based approach in which mm -hmm. we're trying to get participants to adhere to um, some type of medication for, say, treatment of opioid use disorder, things like methadone or naltrexone or buprenorphine. Uh, so I think we call it psychosocial to differentiate it from like a medication-based approach. Okay. Ken Sellerman, our director, we're, we all have behavior analytic backgrounds. Um, we have another, another person, Andy, who also has a master's in behavior analysis, but I would say a lot of um, our other staff members are from different backgrounds, typically in the public health area or interested in substance use, um, but aren't necessarily behavior analysts. Maybe what are, what are a few of the different types of treatment approaches that have been tried? on solving those issues. Oh, like different, what approaches other people have taken? Yeah, like a little bit of history. <sighs> to like okay. History. Yeah, so for employment-based interventions, I'd say there hasn't been a ton done with individuals who have substance use disorder. The studies that have been done haven't been all that effective. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say there's generally two pro approaches that um, interventions take when they're trying to promote employment and that can be um, more quick entry approaches in which we try to give people some very basic skills and try to get them employed as quick as we can probably in um, you know entry-level jobs and then there's more of a education based approach in which you're focused on teaching individuals maybe job skills or educational skills that might allow them to get a higher pay, paying job. Uh, and I think there's not uh, really clear evidence of which approach would be better. What about abstinence-based interventions where we're rewarding people for not engaging in this sort of drug use? I think for a lot of those those abstinence reinforcement interventions, there's actually a, a good, a strong history behind them showing that they're effective. There's been quite a bit of research done to try to pick out the parameters that we know are most critical to the effectiveness of those interventions. So things like immediacy of the reinforcer, 
uh, the magnitude of the reinforcer, you know, typically the larger the better. Um, we've also seen with a lot of our work that maintaining those reinforcement contingencies over time is really important to maintaining the behavior. Um, so these are a lot of things that, you know, more behavior analytic people will probably be very familiar with. Um, but there's been a decent number of controlled studies done in that area to tease apart those effects. Um, and with that graph, with this study, this was specifically um, using employment-based reinforcement as our reinforcer, so giving people access to paid employment in our therapeutic workplace as a way to promote abstinence. So this is really important. We don't have to necessarily change the person. We just have to work with them on arranging the environment to promote avoiding this drug use. What's it, can you walk me through like what it's like if someone is looking to receive help from here? What, it, what does the process kind of look like for them? Yeah, so one thing I guess to mention about our center is that most of what we do is um, controlled trials that are typically federally funded, so funded through um, mechanisms like the National Institutes of Health. And so typically what participants do in their seeking treatment here will depend on what group they're assigned to. We do have some people that are assigned to a control group. Um, and depending on the study, they um, might just be undergoing um, doing routine assessments with us every month where we kind of track their health and track their drug use. Um, participants that are assigned to our intervention groups are typically invited to attend our therapeutic workplace for that's open to them about 20 hours a week. And we pay them for engaging in job skills training um, and then over time, we introduce drug abstinence contingencies, um, and it just kind of depends on the study what drug we're chart what drug we're targeting. Uh, typically, we've focused a lot on cocaine use because there's not any medication-based treatments for that that work. Mm -hmm. um, we've also looked, done studies with heroin use, and right now we're um, focusing on alcohol use in one of our studies. In phase one of the clinical trial, um, we. Uh, use abstinence reinforcement to get them off of opiates and cocaine uh, and then uh, you know they complete that part and then they moved on to phase two where they could work with the employment and all that stuff so anyways when they're getting paid to work with the employment specialists the half the people who are getting paid to do that um, their pay their they earn hourly wages also that are based on their continued abstinence so we're keeping them off of uh, whatever drugs they were using um, and then we're also getting them towards employment and so after that if they manage to get a job they still come in and they turn in the uh, urine samples to show that they're maintaining abstinence um, but in addition to what they earn through employment they can earn um, abstinence contingent wage supplements and so you guys were talking about the opportunity NYC and all that uh, but uh, so this has been uh, effective um, cool. we, we got significant improvements in employment. So significantly more people in the incentive group became employed. Um, and there's also an effect on poverty level, which is like, that's that's insane yeah, yeah, to me, yeah. right? Like we talk about why do you get into behavior analysis? Like you wanna save the world. These are yeah. big, big things. And uh -huh. everyone thinks I can do something about that, but, but they're really doing something about it. So that's pretty, that, that's, you know, I'm really jazzed about yeah. being a part of that. No, for sure I can tell, yeah. that's cool. The, the skill building, is that the computer-based stuff that you're talking yes. about? What does that look like? Yeah. What sort of skills? and? Yeah, for currently we typically will have participants um, just engaging in learning basic computer skills. A lot of times our participants will come in and not have those skill sets, so even like using a mouse is yeah. something that's new for them. Um, so we teach them basic computer skills, how to type and use the keyboard. We'll also sometimes have them do um, just basic educational programs, things like math or reading. Um, when they're here working with us. Is that why, uh, if I remember right, it was focused on um, kind of like simulating a data center in here? It was actually started, right? Yeah, the Hopkins oh. Data Center. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that was a that was pretty great. Um, so with our therapeutic workplace model, typically participants will go through two phases. In the first phase, they're just here working in our workplace. They're working on those basic computer skills that I was talking about. Um, and then after 
phase one will typically initiate abstinence in phase one and then they'll progress to phase two and the idea there is that they're actually hired as regular employees um, in a perhaps income producing job and the Hopkins Data Services was um, something that we established, we actually call it our social business model, um, that participants would, uh, they were paid as data entry operators and the idea was that bi that business might be able to sustain itself so participants would have um, a job that they could go into after participating in phase one. Yeah, I like that for a few reasons, like uh, fitting it into uh, our economical, uh, economic and like social situation seems pretty uh, smart to do if you're when you're when you're trying to integrate something in right into a, like this larger system. But also, the I feel like that might be a way because the for all of these that maintenance seems to be an issue, right? Right. And that and then when we're talking about abstinence-based uh, reinforcement and especially monetary value on that. I assume the question comes up of where's this funding coming from afterwards. Right. So I like that because it can be fit into something that doesn't require additional funding right. theoretically, right? Yeah, that's a great thing about the, the social business model. A potential downside of it is that it potentially has limited slots. Um, so the you only have as many, you can only hire as many people as you have positions to hire for those social businesses. Um, so one thing that we're evaluating or just finished evaluating currently that we're really excited about is our wage supplement model. And with that, participants are offered abstinence contingent wage supplements if they find and obtain employment in the community. Okay. Um, and so in that sense, we, with the wage supplement, we match some of their pay that they're already getting, earning and working in the community. Um, but they have to continue to provide drug negative urine samples. So it is a way to maintain those contingencies over time. Um, and with that, there's actually been governments in the U.S. and Canada who have implemented wage supplements in low-income populations, and sometimes it's for trying to promote employment. Um, so there is some precedent for doing it in the real world, okay. I would say, which is good. So, you know, it shows that there's actually perhaps an interest of governments to fund that type of intervention. Setting up, the, you know, developing computer-based training, so some of the work that's done here in the Center for Learning and Health or the, ther the therapeutic workplace has participants who come in and they'll work on whatever training program. So it might be, I haven't done anything with the math or reading yeah. programs, um, but August and I I have recently, well, we're, right now we're, in, we're collecting data on an opioid uh, overdose prevention program. So we're teaching people about um, things associated with using opioids, uh, FDA approved opioid use disorder medications, and uh, what to do in the event of an overdose. And that's part of the education model, right? Yeah. yeah. So Educate them what, what, what these things are doing. Right, right. So that's, that's one of the courses that we do. Because there are things that you find yourself wanting to shout from the rooftops or you consistently are telling people about this program that you just want them to know about? Um, we get, I would say, a lot of pushback um, from people about the use of incentives. So for some reason, a lot of people have a very, not a lot of people, but some people have, I would say, a negative reaction mm -hmm. to um, incentivizing people to engage in behaviors that maybe they should engage in anyway. Um, and that I always find it to be a very interesting thing that we get pushed back on. So I think I like to highlight that there have been a lot of programs done in the real world, like the Opportunity NYC Wage Supplement Program mm -hmm. um, that have delivered incentives, or there's employee wellness programs. Um, those are very common. Um, you know, I get paid for showing up to work every day too yeah. so in a sense that's an incentive program i think you know a lot of people might not continue showing up every day if they were stopped being yeah. paid so yeah. i think you know incentivizing healthy behaviors is actually a, a more common thing than maybe people might think yeah it seems like it's since it's stuck to a substance use that it gets that sort of stigma yeah it can also get really tricky when um 
people think that we're paying substance users in a sense. There is typically some um, worry that they'll just end up maybe using the money for drugs, Mm -hmm. um, which isn't the case with these interventions because of the contingency in, in place. So if they were to use their earnings to try to um, buy drugs and use them, then they would end up being their pay. They would lose a lot of pay for doing that in the long run. So typically with that contingency in place, that's not a behavior we see. So um, our participants, um, it's when we have success stories, it's really nice to see them progress through the program because typically with our therapeutic workplace studies they're pretty long Um, so our last one they our participants were in our first phase for three months and then we had a year-long intervention period and then we have a year follow-up period Um, so participants that find the intervention to be beneficial it's it's nice to see them move through the program it's nice to see them have success it's nice to see them get excited when they get a a job that they really like Um, it's nice to see when they initiate abstinence and it's their first time in their life that they've been abstinent since they started using Um, so I think that that keeps me coming back and keeps me um, wanting to make the intervention better so we can have more people have that cool. type yeah. of success. Sweet, okay. I think I'm good there, if you are. Yeah. I appreciate yeah. it, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> That's your Daily BA. Hey, if you enjoyed this, you're gonna enjoy the series that's over here. And if you have time, this is funded by patrons. Click the top link down below to learn more about how you can support the vision and what I'm trying to build here.